Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching The Daily Debrief. We have a lot to get through on the show today. We're keeping the intros to the absolute minimum. Uh, in our first story, China and Brazil have reached an important deal to move towards bilat bilateral trade in their own currencies, ditching the US dollars, dollar as an intermediary. The deal enables the largest economy in Latin America and the second largest economy in the world to conduct their massive volumes of bilateral trade, which topped a record 150 billion US dollars last year, exchanging yuan for riyash directly, uh, ditching, of course, the intermediary US currency. The Brazilian Trade and Investment Promotion Agency released a statement saying the move is expected to reduce costs, promote even greater bilateral trade, and facilitate investment as well. A preliminary agreement was reached back in January this year, which allowed the announcement to be made at the high-level China-Brazil Business Forum in Beijing, despite the Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva being unable to attend after contracting uh, pneumonia. Pavi Prakayasa, editor-in-chief of, of NewsClick, is with us in studio to discuss the implications of this historic deal. Uh, Prabir, good to have you with us in studio. Uh, another major announcement on, on the trade front from a sort of uh, internationalist perspective, uh, Brazil and China coming to an agreement to use the yuan, bypassing the US dollar as uh, the currency for their trade. They are, uh, China is Brazil's, uh, as we were mentioning, biggest trading partner and the two countries doing close to $150 billion uh, worth of trade annually. So, so a major development. Yes, and I think also it shows a trend that if your major partner in trade is China, both in terms of you know exporting to Brazil, exporting to China, and Brazil importing from China, then obviously why should the currency be dollar and not yuan and not, for instance, a Brazilian currency? Mm. So what is the role of a reserve currency in this case? Because ultimately what you're really negotiating is the difference of import versus exports. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. rest of it is really balancing the books, so to say. Mm. And I think this brings us to the question, what is the role of reserve currency? Mm. And uh, uh, unfortunately for the uh, United States, it became the biggest, it became the reserve currency because in post post the Bretton Woods agreement, it was pegged, US dollar was pegged to the go, it pegged to gold. And it was really gold standard mm. via the dollar, which mm. was then the world's global standard. And uh, once in 1971, uh, it goes off the gold standard, the US goes off the gold standard. Dollar has become the reserve currency without being pegged to anything, anything. Ex except to itself. Mm. <laughs> so therefore, what happens is this works as long as it is the, shall we say, the largest economic heavyweight in the world. Mm. Now, increasingly, when it comes to trade, and it's the external account that is important when you talk about the reserve currency, mm. the external account is still 1990. US was the biggest uh, trade partner of about... 80% of the countries in the world. Today, 80% of the countries, only, two, you know, what, 1990s, I think up to even 2000. Mm. So only about 20 to 30 years down the line, mm. China today is the biggest trade partner of 80% of the countries okay, in the no. world. Mm. Therefore, the role of the reserve currency vis-a-vis -vis China trade mm. is, is obviously weakened at a time when China itself is going off the dollar. Mm. And of course, it still is the biggest uh, holder of dollar reserves in the world, but slowly reducing the dollar reserves it holds. Mm. Now, that is linked to the Russia, uh, Ukraine, okay. NATO war that is going on. Mm. We have termed it as the Russia versus NATO mm. war, which is being fought in Ukraine. So I'll come to that a little later. But the larger current is that the biggest trade partner for most countries in the world today is China, China. not the United States. Therefore, the yuan playing a bigger role in uh, as the currency for trade mm. and still not the reserve currency is uh, emerging. Mm. Now, this does not mean that the reserve currency for the world will still not be the dollar. It will still continue to be the dollar, at least for the foreseeable future because there are a lot of other consequences if yuan wants to become the reserve currency of the world, which I don't think China is willing to do at the moment. Mm. So that's a longer conversation. Again, we won't, get, we won't get into. But having your trade fixed in not the dollar is a consequences, consequence really of the Ukraine war in which 
European Union, led by the United States, under United States leadership, yeah. decided to sanction Russia. They called it sanctions from hell and it will ruble will become rubble. Mm. Ruble has actually strengthened. Mm. It has also meant that a large number of transactions in the world, remember the SWIFT system was under US control, large number of transactions have gone off the SWIFT system because they can't trade with Russia mm. using the SWIFT system. Mm. So all of this meant that the uh, role of dollar has reduced in the world. And I think this is really a sign of that. We'll also have seen Saudi Arabia, other countries wanting to trade with China in Yuan. We have seen India trading with China, uh, with, Russia, with Russia, but in dirhams. Yeah. So you are yeah. seeing multiple currencies being used in the trade. Mm. So this is a sign of, yes, the dollar weakening mm. as a reserve currency, but it still re remains as the preeminent uh, currency. And let's not forget that. So we should not underestimate uh, the United States and the dollar, nor, nor overestimate it. I mm. think both things have to be taken mm. together. Mm. With that sort of uh, financial or, or uh, at least uh, currency sort of scenario, uh, in the from a from a sort of geopolitical perspective, does all of this indicate a shift, uh, not maybe towards multi uh, sort of polarity, but regional agreements and regional understandings uh, becoming the way in which countries kind of negotiate uh, not just trade but also the movement of other things, uh, people, etc. Well, this is of course interregional because Brazil is in Latin America. Yeah. And if you see trade between China and Latin America, most countries in Latin America have trade this, the largest trade, is, trade partner is China, mm. which is really, again, a shift for the last 20, 30 mm. years. <clears throat> so this is really interregional. Mm. But you're right, the regional forces are coming up and they think that if they have to trade among themselves, why should they go via the dollar? Mm. Again, that brings us to the uh, question, what is a reserve currency mm. for the world, you know? Mm. And uh, if that role brings with it the threat of sanctions, mm. and therefore, should they therefore designate their trade in dollars or not? Mm. And dollar designation has the consequence, this is what the United States claims, that if any trade takes place in dollar, that means at the end of it, the Federal Reserve is involved, and therefore it's a transaction under US law. Mm. So the issue is not dollar alone. Mm. That's why I was saying it's not simply the question of reserve currency. Mm. It's a question that therefore any trade, any agreement signed in dollars brings it under US law. Ju and therefore at any point of time, US can say you have violated my law mm. in this particular way. Mm. And therefore you can now be held liable and I can give you a penalty on mm. you. So also designating contracts in dollar therefore brings with it a risk. This happened for the French Czech Alst Alstom group, mm. which was penalized, its uh, senior official was jailed and so on. And ultimately Alstom was forced to sell its boiler division to an American company. Combustion engineering, the boiler company over there. So these are the consequences of having your uh, agreement signed in dollars. Right. So I think c c countries are aware of this kind of risks mm. and are therefore slowly designating trade agreements between themselves mm. in a currency which is not the dollar, mm. which is not transacted through SWIFT. So out of US monitoring mm. as well as out of US control. So mm. these are the things why it is happening at the moment. And as I said, if your main trading partner is not, not the United the States, mm. then of course it becomes much easier. And therefore, you will also see the increasing reliance on uh, currencies other than the dollar from both the oil countries mm. as well as countries like India, for example, or countries like Turkey, who right, therefore like, for instance, a certain number of agreements to be out of US purview. In the case of India, obviously Russia, oil as well as uh, military arms, etc., mm -hmm. which are all essentially being transacted in either third currencies or each other's currencies. I think this is an obvious issue 
for most of the world, mm. given the kind of sanctions spree that the U.S. has gone. I think there is something like 6,000 to 8,000 sanctions. No, no, I may be making completely underestimated. Maybe it is, it's much larger, but you can check the figure out. Yeah. It's a very large number of sanctions they've imposed on. And we have a map that in News Click we show, mm. which shows that how many countries they have sanctioned, the U.S. has sanctioned, and therefore, it's not surprising that countries are then loth now to designate their uh, agreements or trade agreements in, in dollars. All right. Thanks very much, Prabir. Uh, and as we spoke earlier, we'll have you back on the show tomorrow. So looking forward to uh, that as well. Next up, in another first, former U.S. president and frontrunner for the Republican Party's nomination for the 2024 U.S. presidential elections, Donald Trump, will be the first former uh, president to face criminal charges after a sealed indictment was issued in relation to an investigation over payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels as hush money. On Tuesday ne next week, Trump might face the prospect of being processed before being taken into custody and appearing before a Manhattan co uh, court. This is, of course, like we were saying, a historic first in the United States and a development that could have a significant impact on an already divided nation. Anish covers the region for uh, People's Dispatch and joins us now via video conference. Uh, Anish, uh, uh, just before we started recording, you were sharing your more candid observations on this indictment. Uh, <laughs> we, we won't get too much more into it, but, but as a reporter who's been covering this story and looking at the various sort of uh, issues uh, that, uh, you know, have uh, come about uh, both during Trump's re regime and after, of course, January 6 being uh, the foremost among them. Uh, what was your initial and immediate uh, sort of uh, reaction, response to seeing the indictment? Uh, and and what, I, what exactly uh, is this unprecedented uh, criminal indictment uh, actually? What does it mean? Yeah, so there are multiple things to look at in this thing. Uh, first of all, uh, we do not exactly know uh, what will be the specific charges uh, that Trump will be indicted on? Because we, what we know so far is that he had uh, given what the media calls hush money to uh, a former adult entertainment star, and uh, and she, uh, and this was done right before uh, his election and during his election campaign, so that she doesn't divulge uh, more information about the, whatever their uh, relationship they had. A decade ago, uh, so this comes under uh, several laws of uh, corporate fraud, probably, um, or maybe like campaign fraud at, uh, at best. So, in many of these, uh, like even if it's charged for any of these uh, uh, charges or under any of these legal stipulations, it is not going to be as uh, grave uh, in the sense that it may not attract. Uh, a jail sentence, may even if he gets convicted. Uh, more, but more importantly, it is how the prosecution, uh, you know, takes this case forward that is going to be more interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to wait and see what the specific charges are, and that will be once he is surrenders and uh, gets arraigned for uh, for the indictment, and that will mean that he will get arrested uh, and be taken into custody. Um, and that means that uh, he may not be able to campaign currently uh, or uh, or maybe take up like an early campaign uh, for the next year's election. Hmm. Uh, whatever said and done, uh, of the three uh, sort of cases that are going on against him, uh, this is probably in terms of gravity of the crime, uh, the least of... Uh, uh, you know, the least in its, uh, you know, the graveness of the sentencing or, right. you know, the kind of charges that are uh, there. The second question that obviously comes is whether or not he will be uh, able to run for president. Now, the question, the thing with the United States system is that it does not have uh, any kind of provision that disqualifies anybody, uh, even if they get criminally indicted. Uh, there is the only uh, form of disqualification that the U.S. Uh, electoral system allows uh, for somebody from running from president uh, is if they get uh, convicted for uh, insurrection or rebellion against the state. 
And that's a very specific thing that was uh, created uh, right after the American Civil War to keep uh, all the, you know, the Confederate soldiers and fighters and commanders from running for the highest office. So mm. nothing has changed since then. Mm. And uh, what we have right now is that even if, uh, you know, Trump gets convicted, and that is a big if uh, in itself, uh, even if he gets uh, convicted, he can still continue to run for president. He can con even win the election and serve uh, as president uh, uh, unless he goes to jail. So even there, the legal, uh, you know, loopholes that we're looking at, uh, we're not very clear what would happen if he were to be in prison during his presidency. But uh, that's a different question altogether. All right, uh, Anish, we are running a little bit uh, sort of behind time on the show today. So we'll jump straight into the next story, uh, which is, uh, con of course, also eventually concerning the United States. But, uh, but principally, uh, Ma Ying Ju is the first now Taiwanese uh, or the highest ranking uh, Taiwanese official, present or former to visit mainland China since 1949. Uh, what are the sort of what is the background of this visit and what are we hearing uh, from it as well? Yeah, it is quite significant considering the direction that uh, Taiwan has taken uh, under the presidency of Tsai Ing-wen in the, over the past several years now. And uh, the fact that uh, a Kuomintang, a former president, a Kuomintang leader, uh, somebody who is still widely respected in Taiwan, has taken this uh, step to actually not only visit uh, China, but uh, to meet the Taiwan Affairs Council there, and also uh, to you know keep himself open for further meetings with higher officials, which may not happen, uh, mm -hmm. considering the political sensitivity behind that on both sides of the straits. Uh, but nevertheless, the fact that he made a statement that he's open to any kind of meetings, uh, in the, very clearly indicating uh, that he is open to even visit President Xi Jinping, uh, shows that there is a great deal of uh, work happening, on at least on the side of not just Kuomintang, but also a certain section within Taiwan who does not want to continue tensions with China. Uh, we have already seen uh, with size uh, so-called transit uh, mm -hmm. through New York uh, on her way to Guatemala. Uh, there is a uh, Guatemala and Belize. Uh, there was a, a pr protest that happened in Taipei uh, led by uh, workers' movement and uh, progressive sm smaller groups, but nevertheless significant uh, social movements in Taiwan. And the fact that they took out this protest, uh, you know, called out size administration for, uh, you know, provoking and stoking tensions and provocations, and also for betraying what, quote unquote, betraying the country. So, uh, because obviously uh, we, we have seen so far, even though she has not made any statements uh, by herself, uh, the Sai the administration and the DPP at large, uh, her, the ruling party, have always taken a sort of uh, very, uh, you know, uh, soft uh, position to towards uh, separatist movements uh, within Taiwan that have called for and a so-called independent Taiwan, separate from the very identity of China, even though it, it is, you know, very closely tied to uh, Chinese history and politics. Uh, and this uh, is something that is continuing under her uh, administration, and that is something that the KMT is strongly opposed to, and obviously a big section of the Taiwanese society is also opposed to, even though you have a very vocal pro-independence or pro-separatist group within the country. Hmm. So in that sense, this is a, a domestic political story that has quite significant, uh, you know, global or geopolitical ramifications uh, as well. Uh, so, so, so just very finally and as quickly as you possibly can, uh, g give us a sense of, of how, uh, you know, the, the various other par parties at play, particularly the US, uh, what role they are playing in the entire situation. The U.S. has definitely taken, uh, you know, uh, taken to a point where it will play for uh, play through all of these provocations against China, and uh, we've seen the manner in which uh, they have been tight-lipped about whether or not the House Speaker will be uh, meeting with Tsai Ing-wen uh, on her way back to Taiwan uh, through Los Angeles. 
and uh, that only shows how they're just trying to push uh, the boundaries of provocations uh, to the point where it does not actually become a conflict. But nevertheless, uh, that is what the U.S. has done. But we, have, as we have spoken about this before, uh, this is also, as you pointed out, a reflection of domestic politics and a change uh, also happening on the ground. Recently, local elections were swept by the opposition uh, led block, uh, opposition block led by uh, the Kuomintang, and they are obviously uh, this is the second such visit uh, from one of their leaders. So they are definitely pushing not only uh, for a national campaign to you know come back to power uh, by next year, but also uh, to you know uh, to create a discourse that uh, does not play into uh, sort of U.S. Provo- U.S.-led provocations against China. All right. Uh, interesting sort of set of developments there, and and hopefully like a, a, what is developing into a major flashpoint. Uh, through this uh, electoral sort of uh, process can uh, come to some kind of resolution. All right. Thanks very much, Anish, for all the updates today and for your time. And that, with that, we also uh, will bring to a close this episode of The Daily Debrief. As always, thank you very much for watching. You can head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on all of these stories and the other work we do. Uh, we'll be back for our last episode of the week tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, goodbye.